Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. It's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 833 for the 22nd of September 2024. 833 on the 22nd. 83322. I always find it fascinating, uh, the subject of numerology, how people can get numbers and look at them and see patterns where there aren't necessarily patterns as part of being human. By the way, this is Richard Saunders coming to you from Sydney, Australia on a very sunny morning. Uh, yeah, oh, I can see the sun hitting the tops of the trees outside the studio window. And a couple of nights ago, three or four nights ago, something like that, we had a supermoon. And indeed, just last night, driving through Sydney after some babysitting duties by yours truly, I saw a magnificent moon low in the sky, peering through the clouds. It was almost something out of uh, out of a dystopian science fiction future. It looked very nice. Something else that is very nice is the wonderful voice of Adrian Hill, our reporter from Calgary, Canada. And this week, Adrian Hill catches up with a, a favorite of the Skeptic Zone podcast, Melanie Tresick King. They're going to discuss science outreach and what is it about skepticism? What does it what does what does skepticism mean to you? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is the name misused? I think it is. I think it is because we have for years had people calling themselves skeptics who are really deniers. For example, uh, moon landing skeptics, and more recently, vaccination skeptics, or indeed the big one, of course, climate change skeptics. And more than once, more than twice, more than many times, I've um, said to people I'm a skeptic and they've assumed that I'm someone who doesn't believe in the moon landing, for example. And uh, from time to time, the skeptical community wonder whether we should call ourselves something else. It's a tricky one, because then you get into words like, oh, we'll call ourselves the critical thinkers, which doesn't really resonate with the public, <laughs> or, the, <laughs> or something like that. It's a problem we can ponder with Melanie Trisick King and Adrian Hill, coming up at the top of the show. After that, I had a little chat with Tim Mendham, the editor of The Skeptic magazine and the executive officer of Australian Skeptics. We were recording The Book of Tim a week or two back, and we took out some time to make a little video, and this is the audio of the video, uh, talking about the Bent Spoon Award, presented to the perpetrator of the most paranormal... No, what is it? I always get this mixed up. The perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of pseudoscientific or paranormal piffle. Or words to that effect. The Ben Spoon has been going now for over four decades. And there are very interesting people in the running this year, including, again, for the second year in a row, in the running at least, Ross Coulthard, the, um, the man who is getting a lot of mileage out of UFOs. I wonder how many miles you can get to a UFO these days. Or light years? Can you imagine a used flying saucer salesman on another planet? What do you do? Do you kick the tires that don't exist? You kick the outside? You uh, slam the doors? <laughs> I wonder what a new flying saucer or a UFO goes for these days. Maybe you have to go to a special planet to buy one. Anyway, I digress. The Bent Spoon Award for 2024. Who's on the shortlist? Find out with a short piece by Tim Mendham and myself. Then to round off the show, it's back to the Trove Archives. And we look for references to the word or the term snake oil. And I was quite interested to see what came back through the pages of history as reported in newspapers here in Australia when it comes to snake oil. Now, speaking of the Ben Spoon and Skepticon, of course, the Ben Spoon Award will be awarded at Skepticon this year. 
in uh, late November here in Sydney. Get your tickets now at skepticon.org.au. But if you go to that website, at the top of the page or near the top of the page, you'll see a a colourful image, a colourful flyer. You can download and print out. And if you're in the Sydney area especially, then you have access to a, a university bulletin board or a community bulletin board, then please, we um, request of you that you print out the flyer and uh, in black and white or colour and post it around. Let other people know that the uh, Australian Skeptics National Convention is coming up. Cannot wait to see my old friend Ben Radford flying out especially for the convention. And if you're not coming to the convention but you're in Sydney anyway, well, please feel free to come to our special pub night on Friday the 22nd of November at the Occidental Hotel near Windyard Station. Uh, Skeptical trivia. Special guest Ben Radford. You can have a a chinwag with Ben and then see if you can beat the skeptical brains at trivia. And if you're not in Sydney, and if you're not in Australia, or even if you are and you can't come to the convention, you can virtually come to the convention because it will be online as well. And you can get your tickets for the online experience at skepticon.org.au. So no matter where you are around the world, you can join us at the Australian Skeptics National Convention and hear the wonderful speakers and uh, panels. Now, just before we get stuck into the show, every now and then on the show, you might hear uh, this little promotion. Tadaima. You might be curious to know what that's all about if you don't speak Japanese. Well, that's our wonderful reporter, Michelle Biggersmar, of course, who is a uh, a Japanese teacher, or she teaches Japanese. And she did that little promo for the show a little while back. And what that is saying, if you go to skepticzone.tv, scroll to the bottom of the page There are free posters for you to download. And these are my uh, personal origami art and photography. And um, I'm very pleased to know some people have been printing those out and using them in schools, for example, because it's a nice, happy, colorful series of photographs of of, uh, origami you can print out. So that's what that's all about, if you were wondering. But that's enough for me at the moment. It's time for me to run downstairs and not have a can of root beer because I was in the suburb of Chatswood here in Sydney just yesterday and I came across a store which was uh, something that said uh, American candy. Oh, I thought I'll have a look in there and lo and behold in the fridge there were uh, cans of root beer, my favorite drink. I inquired and they said it costs uh, $4 a can or $35 a case. As much as I love root beer, I might just have to wait till I'm back in the Bay Area. So I won't have a root beer. Instead, I'll have a nice cup of coffee while I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello, this is Adrian Hill from Skookum Studios in Calgary, Canada. At the end of our amazing holiday to Iceland and Greenland, we ended up in the Boston area where I met up with Melanie Tresick King on August 28th. We talked about a lot of things, her busy schedule, her upcoming article in Skeptical Inquirer with Bertha Vasquez, who is the Educational Director for the Centre of Inquiry. And I finally got to meet the famous Dimitri, the thinking is power kitty cat. Hello, everybody. Right now, I am not in Skookum Studios. I am actually in Melanie Tresic King's studio. 
Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. So, Melanie, you've been busy in the last little bit. Tell us a little bit about Thinking is Power. First of all, I know you've been on the Skeptic Zone before, but remind our listeners what that website is about. So, Thinking is Power is based on the premise that knowledge is power, but there's too much to know. And we carry access to basically all of humanity's knowledge in our pockets anyway, but also misinformation. So the question is, when you need reliable information, can you find it and think about it in a way that it helps you make better decisions? And it came out of my class. Um, I designed a class for non-science majors to teach them what I thought was the most important aspect of science, which is how we know something and why we need science to begin with. And I thought, well, maybe people will be interested. So I tell silly jokes about cats and farts and use lots of color and stupid comics and hopefully teach a little something along the way. Yeah, I've seen several of your lectures, one at SciCon or two at SciCon. I understand you're going to be there for a third time this year. I am. I am so excited. I didn't know SciCon was a thing, actually, until basically until I went. And wow, it blew my mind. Yeah, so fun story. On Somebody recommended, John Guy actually, recommended that I apply for the Sunday morning papers. I didn't know what PsychOn was. I didn't know what Sunday morning papers were. And I thought, I applied, they accepted, and just felt like my people have been here this whole time, and I didn't even know it. And it was so wonderful. And I've been so lucky that they invited me back to speak and then coming back again this time. Speaking of PsychOn, you told me a story a little earlier about some people from NASA. Can you tell that story? Yeah, so the first year we were at Zycon, I snuck away to the pool because I love pools. And um, there was a couple of gentlemen there from NASA. They were NASA scientists. And so we got to talking and they were there for another conference. And when they asked me what I was there for, I told them, you know, Zycon. I explained what it was and um, an organization about skepticism. And they looked at me. They had the constipated look on their face like, oh, no. <laughs> and finally, one of them says, you mean like flat earth? And climate change denial? (laughs) I was like, no, but if you think that, we have a real branding problem. (laughs) We have got to get the word out there. (laughs) I agree. I've run into that same thing where people, if you say something about being skeptical, they think that you're skeptical of mainstream medicine, for example. I've run into that. I think it is a problem. I think maybe the word's been co-opted a little bit. That's part of the problem. Nobody really wants to call themselves the denier. So skeptical, I think, just sounds more palatable to people. Oh, no, I agree with that. You've had a pretty busy year touring around the planet. And this last summer as well, you've done a lot of speaking and you have some more speaking coming up. I understand you're going to be touring Denver. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Sure. Yeah, I've been really lucky. My mom is still kind of surprised that people want to hear me talk because apparently I've been talking since I came out of the womb and... Haven't been able to get me shut up since then, but apparently people want to hear me now. I am speaking in Denver at the Secular Hub this coming weekend. I'm speaking at the Nebraska Science Teachers Association Conference in October uh, at Saigon mm-hmm. in October, the National Science Teachers Association Conference in New Orleans, the New York one in November as well. Yeah, I got a couple of, of busy months ahead. Yeah, it's exciting. You've done very well. I always look forward to your talks. They're always wonderful. And I learn a lot. And I thought it was really interesting at Skeptical, your panel that you were on, and how Dr. Carl Kruzlaniski was admiring of your work. And he said he was learning from you and wanted to attend your class. Yeah, that was humbling. I mean, first of all, I was on a panel with Dr. Carl. um, And yeah, to hear to hear that feedback, because he had said something about changing people's minds on aspects of science and how like we just need to get people more information. And I think, well, actually, I'm not sure that that's true. I think people need to understand why they fall for misinformation. So understanding the characteristics of the misinformation is important, but we're all prone to falling for things. And when we don't want to believe something, our standard of evidence is higher. And when we do, our standard of evidence is lower. And so, you know, we need to be aware of those kinds of motivations. And yeah, he said that he was learning a lot from me and wanted to take my class. And I just about like, well, he just about shut me up. Let me say that. (laughs) It was very humbling. (laughs) It was wonderful. And his offerings were excellent as well. He's a really good dynamic speaker. And his style choices are pretty spectacular. I agree. (laughs) Elaborate. Well, apparently his wife makes his shirts for him. Yes, his outfits are wonderful. One of the things that was brought up, I believe, there was about how to talk to people 
who have these difficult beliefs. And you and I had a little chat earlier about how difficult it is when it's just you're sitting down, you're talking with somebody at a table for dinner, and you're never going to see them again. And they come out with some interesting things like we had one person at our table who was a nurse for 40 years who said she tried acupuncture on the ship for the first time and it cured her rheumatoid arthritis. She'd never felt better. And I don't know if she used the word cure, but it was pretty strong. Like I've never felt better. And how do you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, I suppose it couldn't be the fact that she's on vacation and relaxing and any number of things. Yeah. This is really hard. I struggle with this all the time. Whenever people find out that I help counter misinformation, people always respond with misinformation is a huge problem, but what they mean is it's somebody else's problem. Mm-hmm. Somebody else is too stupid and they fall for things that aren't true, but I, I would never do that, right? I'm too smart. And almost without fail, there's always something that reveals itself. And it's hard to know whether you should engage in a conversation or not. And if so, how? When you're having dinner with somebody that you're never going to see again, then that's really dicey. The relationship isn't necessarily the important part for you there, but if we don't handle it well, then they're going to leave not only not believing us or changing their mind, but maybe even with a negative impression of what we were trying to say. Mm-hmm. To me, the important part is the empathy piece of somebody, somebody's really falling for something that's probably not true here. Is this worth touching upon? And if so, nobody wants to think that they're stupid. So not making them feel stupid. Yeah. So would you talk to them about it or would you just leave it? I guess either one would be appropriate in the moment. I think that's really situational. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very tough. And also like how dangerous the belief is probably. If it was somebody that was trying to cure their kid's cancer with acupuncture, then I think I would probably be a bit more willing to wade into those waters. Yeah, that's a good point. The severity, like in this particular case, she was just feeling better in the moment and that's fine, right? But if she was saying, I've talked my grandson into acupuncture to cure his cancer, the next question might be, are they also getting chemotherapy or the correct treatment? Yeah, absolutely. That can be done with empathy, as you say. Yeah, I think it would need to be because if not, then they're just going to leave with a negative impression of, of you and not believe you. Do you have anything else that you'd like to chat about? Anything that you're going to be doing in the next little while or some ideas, some crazy ideas that you've encountered in the last couple of weeks or anything like that? Well, actually, I have an article that's coming out soon in Skeptical Inquirer about critical thinking, and I'm pretty excited about it. The article was, do you know Bertha Vasquez? I do. Bertha is wonderful. Love her. And, you know, as an educator, I've been on this teach skills, not facts, right? We teach critical thinking. And she keeps saying, you know, Melanie, we do teach critical thinking. And so it took a while for me to realize that, you know, like step one, when having a conversation with somebody using critical thinking is that you want to define your terms. And we weren't talking about the same thing. (laughs) We were literally having conversations past each other about critical thinking, right? It's really ironic. So the two of us wrote companion pieces about this and about what critical thinking is and the kinds of ways to teach it in the classroom. And it was my attempt to try and articulate So it's not my definition of critical thinking. The skeptic community actually is largely who taught me this. I came from a science background. I was teaching biology and I was teaching students how to think through biology concepts, biological concepts. So like when we talked about mitosis, it wasn't just mitosis, but like how things could go wrong to lead to cancer. And what I realized was they weren't going to remember that. (laughs) And that probably wasn't even the most important thing that they needed to know. Like if somebody was touched by cancer, then they need to know where to find good information and who to trust and understand the kinds of thinking errors that could lead them to falling for acupuncture as a cure for cancer. And so um, the skeptic community, this is how I found them. Like I was diving into the authors in this space and they were basically just talking about good thinking. Mm-hmm. about the biases and heuristics that lead us astray and about logical fallacies and um, the limits of our perception and memory. Why, why aren't anecdotes good evidence and the value of skepticism and what even that is? And and so that that was the definition that I had adopted. So this article is my attempt to try and clarify that and distinguish it between how it's taught in a lot of science classes. So I'm really excited about this because I think that we need to do more of this kind of teaching of critical thinking more broadly. And I say that as someone who was not taught these things myself. I learned them when I was trying to create a class for the average person 
what I thought in a single semester, what they would need to know about science. And that's when I realized how much I hadn't learned in the process. Mm -hmm. So all that's to say, that was my rambling view of saying, I am excited about my upcoming article about critical thinking, because I really hope it starts a conversation on how we teach critical thinking. That's excellent. And I have a question for you based on that. As a high school math teacher, my view prior to learning about this community of critical thinking was problem solving. Well, that is one definition. Yeah. And that's what like Bertha was using. That's what the yeah. Next Generation Science Standards uses, is the problem solving aspect. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that you need to have really deep content knowledge to be able to think critically about these topics. And I actually think that I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. It is important. Problem solving is an important part of learning. However, we need to add in this other component. Yes. Because I even, now that I spend a lot of time communicating science online, I see people who overestimate their abilities to know things and think about things. They like to call themselves an independent thinker or a critical thinker or even a skeptic. And, and those things really mean reflecting on your own knowledge, knowing what you don't know, what kinds of motivations might be driving your reasoning. Where are sources of information who are the experts in this space? How do I find more reliable knowledge? And all of that's missed. In, in a classroom, what we do is we give students reliable information, and then we ask them to think through it. The real world, they don't have the spoon-fed reliable knowledge. There's anything that they can pick up. And it can take a lot of knowledge to know the difference between misinformation and good information, and also to put the pieces together and think about it. Well said. Anything else? No, it's just great to see you again. I agree. It's so great to see you again. Well, let's make this a yearly thing. I agree. If I come back here, I'll come back to the Cat Cave. Until next time, this is Adrian Hill from the Cat Cave. And that's a wrap. <laughs>
It's no, it's grown. just the one on top. It's great. And it's been added to. So it's getting heavier and heavier. You're right. It gets heavier every year. And I'm glad to say that this year, once again, or am I glad to say it, this year, once again, it will be awarded. Who's in the running, Tim? Well, quite a few people. And I'm glad you asked me that, Richard. Yes. Okay. Uh, in the running again is, is our friend uh, Ross Coulthard, who uh, won last year. He's an Australian journalist, award-winning journalist who was having a fun time last year um, announcing a lot of uh, information that was just about to come out. About UFOs? About UFOs, UFOs yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, any day now. Any day now. Any day now would come out. It hasn't yet, but anyway. Uh, and this year he's uh, you sort of adding to his um, beautiful reputation that he's uh, had a long interview with Yuri Geller. Oh. oh, and Yuri Geller, of course, is, uh, knows a lot about UFOs. A lot about UFOs, yes. absolutely. Who else is in the running? Who else is in the running? Uh, well, we have some TV and some uh, radio media yes. um, who have been doing interesting things in Australia recently. Uh, one of the stories is about uh, Channel 7, which is an Australian commercial TV station. Uh, on their evening news, which is the main news broadcast, they've included a segment devoted to... Astrology. They have an astrologer, a, an expert astrologer. An expert. Pro probably the best in Australia. The best in Australia. Australia's number one astrologer. They no all doubt. are. They, they can only are. count as far as one, can't they? That's right. Everyone's a one. No one's a two. Well, actually, anyway. Uh, Nightly astrology. There Nightly astrologer okay. giving predictions about based on your star sign, which any astrologer would tell you is garbage. But anyway, <laughs> but it's, it's entertainment on the news program. Uh, we're looking forward to having a psychic on as well, mm -hmm. perhaps a dowser to find the news. The dowser, uh, yes. Else. They just take the news off and put all these people they on. They should have a dowser on the weather reports. That would be the way to do it. That'd be a good that way. Be, yeah, there, I feel rain in a certain That's area. <laughs> now, also, this year in the running is a psychic who communicates with ghosts using a radio. That's right, which zips through the zips channels through. and... Um, and picks up random noises and things. And he says, see, that's a ghost. There's a ghost. Uh, we and, also, sorry. And also we have the, uh, the the questionable treatment for autism. That's right. Again, the media. Uh, mm. Again, Channel 7 is having a bit of a, a run here, along with some other media, Channel 9, two major commercial stations, uh, free-to-air TV, and a radio station in Queensland who are all promoting this uh, treatment for autism, which is using... Red or orange lasers, yeah, pointing at your head, light at least or something, yeah, pointing at your head, and obviously with uh, photobiomodulation, which is you know, we isn't all that use. a song in Mary Poppins? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. But uh, Media Watch even pointed out how this device they're using looks like something from Doctor Who. It's uh, it does, yes, yeah. it's the sonic screwdriver of uh, medicine, <laughs> right. really. Um, yes, so other people, including medicine, there's a uh, I think it's a company called Pharmacare, which is selling uh, gummies, sort of vitamin gummies, vitamin which are gummies. gummies full of sugar, uh -huh. which is always an interesting combination, actually. So uh, that's been nominated. Um, and I think that's about it for the time being. Like there might, but there will be more. I know there will be more because our call is out to people to nominate their preferred perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudo-scientific piffle. So we look forward to that. We do. And, of course, we look forward to presenting this award at Skepticon here in Sydney. And you can get your tickets for Skepticon by visiting www.skepticon.org.au. We'll see you at the dinner and we'll see who ends up with the Ben Spoon Award. Congratulations, Richard. <laughs> Again. This is Maynard speaking to you from my shirt. Did you know that you can listen to The Skeptic Zone on YouTube? That's right, The Skeptic Zone's on the internet now. Sounds crazy, but it's true. I checked. You can also hear 40 Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma and funny sketches with Richard Saunders and a host of other skeptics. And some that aren't. There's one that's not skeptical at all. They're totally incredulous about the whole thing. Want short bursts of skepticism? We have a TikTok channel covering things like talking to the dead, hello, no, still nothing, spoon bending and astrology. That's right, I was born under the sign of the photocopier. All these and more are on the homepage at skepticzone.tv. Also, you can visit me, Maynard, at maynard.com.au for my adventures, oh, sorry, for my alleged adventures, online video specials and free downloads. Yep, like a free, I don't know, a free something. Like a free thing that arrives in your mailbox. Like a free catalogue in your... It's as interesting as a free catalogue in your mailbox you didn't ask for. 
online video specials and free downloads like the printable Maynard calendar for all of 2024. September's my favourite month. Yes, spend every month with me or put it on the back of the toilet door of someone you don't like. I don't know. time once again to head back to those archives at Trove and other resources, primarily at Trove, the online digital resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia, those hardworking people. Or maybe it's done by uh, artificial intelligence these days. Hmm, no, I, I think it's still largely done by humans. And the range of topics we've looked at over the last few years has been uh, considerable. Now, many of the topics we've covered over the last while have been to do with alternative medicine, various modalities and whatnot. But today I thought we'd look at the term snake oil. Now, snake oil has been used for generations and it is, according to Wikipedia, Snake oil is a term used to describe deceptive marketing, healthcare fraud, or a scam. Similarly, snake oil salesman is a common label used to describe someone who sells, promotes, or is a general proponent of some valueless or fraudulent cure, remedy, or solution. The term comes from the snake oil that used to be sold as a cure all elixir for many kinds of physiological problems. Many 18th century European and 19th century United States entrepreneurs advertised and sold mineral oil, often mixed with various active and inactive household herbs, spices, drugs, and compounds, but containing no snake-derived substances whatsoever. But as snake oil liniment, making claims about its efficacy as a panacea. Patent medicines that claimed to be a panacea were extremely common from the 18th century until the 20th century, particularly among vendors masking addictive drugs, such as cocaine, amphetamine, alcohol, and opium-based concoctions, or elixirs to be sold at medicine shows as medication or products promoting health. Now, in my search through the various newspapers and whatnot, the term snake oil is most used uh, in one of the earlier descriptions here in this item, deceptive marketing, or indeed it's used for certain politicians, calling them snake oil salesmen. But let's have a look in the, some of the archives, the newspaper archives, to see what we can find. year 1935 on the 2nd of June as reported probably a syndicated story in the Sunday Times from Perth Western Australia bathing in smelly snake oil latest women's fad by Yvette whoever Yvette was the latest fad of London society women is the snake oil bath it is one of the recently discovered beauty secrets and the cost is a paltry eight guineas, and that's in capitals, for a small drum and it is also the newest slimming treatment. The baths are given in the rooms of a masseuse and the peculiar odour which pervades the rooms is reminiscent of a snake house at the zoo and this gives away the secret of the bath. Snake oil. The natives of the East Indies use a certain oil said to have marvelous energizing and rejuvenating properties, and a specialist discovered this and decided to have supplies sent to her headquarters in London. The oil is said to make the subjects feel and look years younger than their actual age. Really, I wonder where I can get some of this. The oil has been extracted from the skin the moment the reptiles are caught. Because the oil is so penetrating, 
that the skin mops it up like blotting paper. The oil seeps into the cells of the body, making middle-aged flesh, or flesh that has grown flabby after illness, firm, taut, and young again. It, and in capitals, draws out acidity, and by its action on the glands causes a quick reduction of weight. Dieting and exercising are unnecessary. About 40 baths are needed, good grief, and should be taken every day. The skin looks and feels like cream satin afterwards, but the smell! It is a thing which one has to learn to ignore and try to hide with liberal sprinklings of eau de cologne. And from the Australian Women's Weekly, a little bit later that year, so on the 31st of August, 1935, Snake oil baths for beauty's sake, latest in fashionable treatments. From our London office, by airmail. Airmail, that's exciting. I remember writing to people overseas using special envelopes. Airmail. We used to buy airmail paper envelopes and uh, pads at the newsagent when, when I was a little kid. That was exciting. You might remember it yourself. It had a certain striped pattern on it, red and blue, I think and the paper was exceedingly thin. And for little kids, it was good for tracing things out. Science has just given us a new beauty secret. Baths of snake oil are the rage amongst the leading beauties in London, New York, and Paris. Snake oil is the most sensational discovery for both slimming and rejuvenating purposes. It seeps into the cells of the body, making middle-aged flesh, or flesh that has grown flabby after illness, firm, taut, and young again. It draws out all the acidity and, by its action on the glands, causes a quick reduction of weight. The oil costs 80 guineas for a small drum, and it is necessary to have a course of one bath a day for 40 days to attain the result. After the treatment, the patient is, to all appearances, 15 years younger, and the marvellous energising and rejuvenating qualities of the oil have done their work, both mentally and physically. The originator of this treatment is an American woman who is having large amounts of this expensive oil brought to London. Quote, While I was travelling in the East Indies, end quote, she said, quote, I noticed the natives used a certain oil said to have marvellous rejuvenating properties. I tried it and was amazed at the results. It has to be extracted the moment the reptiles are caught as the oil is so penetrating that the skin mops it up like blotting paper, end quote. So it seems to me this is simply a reworking of the, um, the previous story. There is one drawback to this new beauty secret. The patient must resign herself to great unpopularity during the course of the treatment. She will be shunned by her nearest and dearest. The reason is the smell of the snake oil is horrible, and it sticks to the body and clothes, and even permeates the house. So maybe lots of us prefer to keep our years after all. I wonder... I wonder what the uh, the truth is behind this story. I wonder if people were really taking a bath in this smelly, well, whatever it was. It's hard to imagine that uh, gallons of snake oil were being um, shipped around the world. But now let's jump to the year 1954, as reported in the Morning Bulletin from Rockhampton in Queensland. Snake oil for the nerves. Tokyo, Associated Press. Feeling nervous and run down, Tokyo's well-patronized snake oil and newt powder shops may have just what you need. Bonafide medical specialists in Japan have worked wonders since the end of World War II, but a portion of the population still, as for generations past, hunts panaceas in the snake oil shops. You can get powdered bear's stomach or monkey's head, depending on what's wrong with you, or if the prescription doesn't call for such mixtures, 
the medical mystics practice moxa and acupuncture. We read on. Moxa was first noted in Japan by a Dutch ship's doctor in the 16th century. The modern moxa practitioner has learnt to cloak his ancient treatment in the garb of pseudo-scientific mumbo-jumbo. That's interesting, an early sceptical report there. Moxa is a sort of a soft, woolly poultice made from the young leaves of the Chinese wormwood. The practitioners claim the leaves absorb ultraviolet rays while glowing. By burning the moxa against the patient's flesh, the stored-up rays are pinpointed into the body, they say. Wow, there are things around to this very day which make sort of similar sort of claims. The patient seeking treatment enters the moxa temple where the sensei, or learned one, squats on a grass mat. He listens to a complaint and then, with a practiced motion, attaches a moxa cone to an appropriate spot on the patient's body. An attendant lights the cone and the smoke rolls lazily upwards in a thin blue line. For six weeks, the patient will have a festering sore and after that, a permanent scar. Scarred bodies are evidence there are many repeaters at the Moxa Temple. Use of needles. In the combination treatment waiting room of the acupuncture doctor, and doctors in quotation marks, illness is expelled by jabbing the patient with needles. A young mother awaited the attentions of the doctor on behalf of her son. A moist, rasping sound issued from the child's throat. Asthma, the doctor said. Quote, he had it bad, but he is cured now. End quote. The mother nodded in agreement. The child's wheezing breathing was interrupted by a desolate wail as the mother unwound yards of woolen underwear to bear its back. As the doctor stroked the child's back, a faint redness appeared in the wake of his hand. With each stroke, a needle of hair-like fineness slashed an almost invisible line. The doctor selected another needle fitted into an inch-long sleeves. The two-inch needle was placed on the child's shoulder. A sharp jab and the needle plunged into the flesh. The child bellowed anew. Quote, tuning the nerves, end quote, the doctor explains. If patients complain of a headache, the snake oil boys often recommend the powder of a roasted and ground monkey's head. Presumably monkeys don't have headaches. At least no one ever heard a monkey complain. For stomach ache, there is ground bear stomach. The theory is that a bear can eat anything. Newt powder is reputed to cast a mean romantic spell. Here's the recipe. First, take two newts, which are lizard-like animals of opposite sex, and stuff them into either end of a hollow bamboo rod so they can rub noses halfway. Then plug the ends of the rod. The newts die of starvation. Hmm, poor newts. That's a bit rough. Bake ovens reduce the remains to a fine powder, which its salesmen say will rouse romance in a rock roebuck. Then there's the combination tonic, which the snake oil merchants claim will help you ward off headaches, attract admiring glances from the opposite sex, and digest a cheap steak. This triple treat bromide is merely a mixture of powdered newt, ground monkey head, and bare stomach. For flavor, the whole mess is stirred up into a pint of rich wine or sake. To add a convincing touch, a small pickled snake floats lazily in each bottle. Although they flourish, there's trouble in store for such shops. The government is beginning to eye them with disfavor and is applying new and heavy taxes. So far, no potion has been stirred up which will soothe that kind of headache. And again, this is from 1954. So, 70 years ago. 
And finally, here's a short story that came up in my general search, and this is from the Daily Telegraph newspaper dated the 19th of May 2013, quite recently, and it's a story by Jane Hansen, who you may recall uh, we reported on only died a few weeks ago, sadly. Jane was a strong advocate for science and reason, and uh, she would often battle the so-called Australian Vaccination Network. And the item reads, anti-vaccination group, the AVN, Australian Vaccination Network, is engulfed in a fresh controversy with the Therapeutics Goods Administration by promoting a cancer cure that medical experts say is dangerous. The product is Black Salve. And I'll just break in here briefly to say I do have a bit of uh, research material about Black Salve, and I encountered it. Well, the DVD of the um, of Black Salve, which is called One Answer to Cancer, was being sold at uh, Sydney's Mind Body Spirit Festival, um, maybe ten or so years ago, or of course, as we call it, the Mind Body Wallet. The product, Black Salve, which contains highly corrosive poisons that can burn layers of skin and leaving scarring, was advertised on the Australian Vaccination Network website as an alternative cancer treatment. This does not surprise me in the least. The ad proclaimed Black Salve as a, quote, safe, effective, natural remedy used for over 2,000 years to treat skin cancers and other cancerous conditions, leading to a total remission of the disease, end quote. But, the Therapeutics Goods Administration said, quote, consumers would be entitled to expect that black salve will cure them of cancer when, in fact, there is no credible, reliable clinical or scientific evidence to demonstrate that the product is effective in treatment of any cancer, end quote. Terry Slevin, chairman of the Skin Cancer Committee for the Cancer Council of Australia, said the product didn't work and it was illegal to sell the product because it is dangerous. And I would submit to you that uh, Black Salve is the very definition, when we speak of alternative medicine, of snake oil. There we are, a little look into the records to see what um, we find when we're looking for snake oil. And I think even today, certain parts of animals, rhinoceros horn, am I getting that right? Are considered to have mystical, magical properties. And uh, I think their best properties are used by the animals they belong to. But I'm glad I found that little uh, piece there by Jane Hansen. I will add that to my files on the Australian Vaccination Network. Snake oil and stinking baths. Well, it just goes to show that when you go to Trove, you never know what you might find. for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast and thank you to those people who support the Skeptic Zone podcast week after week, month after month and year after year at skepticzone.tv While you're there, you can download your origami posters and they support my, uh, of course, PayPal or Patreon and uh, without you, I wouldn't be here talking and everybody else would not be listening. They'd be probably doing something else. Not as interesting. Uh, What's that? That's, that's, that's one of the Skeptic Zone cats outside the studio door. Hang on, let's see. Who's that? 
Hey, Maud, how are you? You want to come in? Uh huh. You want to come in? Maud, what are you doing? I see. Ah. They don't come into the studio often. Oh, because they um tend to walk over cords and up things and and, and make them you know, her tails right on the microphone. Come over here. Why don't you come over over this part? Come on, jump up there. Look out the window. Come on, come here. Jump. There we go. Yeah, she's uh, seeing if she can spot any low flying birds out there. Are you going to sit there? <laughs> That's right, sit on the box. <clears throat> yes, thank you to those people who contribute to the show. Coming up on next week's show, the Trove segment will look, it's a two-part series, part one of uh, Psychic Investigations in Australian History. Sure to be interesting. Are you all, hey, don't do that, don't do that. If you do that, the microphone might fall over. No, no, don't, ah, don't do that. Ahem. But for this week, <laughs> stop that. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders and Maud the Cat. Put that back, put that back. No, it's falling over. Trying to uh, destroy the recording booth here. Signing off from Sydney, Australia. I'm going to get out now. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for episodes and show notes with links going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone on Facebook, X, TikTok and YouTube by clicking the links at our homepage, together with links to support the show financially via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of the Skeptic Zone podcast or any other sceptical organisation. Hey, Giggles and Sparkles are here. Kate and Allie. <laughs> Hi, Allie. Long time no chat. <laughs> yeah, it's been forever. And uh, I thought we could get together and play a little bit of the dice game. I'm going to invoke my inner math teacher, Ooh. and I'm going to call the dice by their fancy names, shall we say. By their proper names. This is a request I got, actually, from a listener. So, hello, Nissa, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And if I didn't, please let me know to get it right. But I know I'm not very good at names sometimes. And her favorite shape is a dodecahedron. So I'm going to roll for the first round a dodecahedron. So, Kat, what is that? Well, I know what it is because you told me <laughs> but my initial guess was a 20-sided die yes was it wrong. was yes i was wrong <laughs> we could do a 20-sided die later and we'll talk about that one because i'm not the math geek that you are um <laughs> yeah I, I i now know because you've taught me ever so well lovely math teacher i can i, I can count on adrian you can count on adrian <laughs> yes it, it's a 12-sided die it is a 12-sided die. So what number do you think you're going to roll? Am I rolling first or are you rolling? I'm going to roll with my little box. You're going to roll. Okay. I think you are going to roll a seven. A seven. I think I'm going to roll a six. A 12. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were half right. I was half right. <laughs> Math joke. That's as good as it gets for this me, folks. I'm sorry. Well done. So are you going to do a do dodecahedron then? Yeah, you say that word. Don't make me, okay? So what do you want to, what, what are you going to roll this time? Um, An eight. An eight. And I kind of like the number 11. Ooh, all right. Let's go for it. You're going to think I'm lying, but it was a 12 again. No. <laughs> it is, let me show the camera. It is a 12. So what is it? A dodecahedron? Yes. Woohoo! Points for me. I got it right. So one more time. All right. What are you going to guess it is? A 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm going to say a one. All right. Both ends of the spectrum. It's the Gerbic number. <gasps> it's a five. Yep. It's a five. So it's the Gerbic number. And so for the last one, have you got an icosahedron handy? I do believe I do. Well, for the listeners like me who didn't know what that was until a few seconds ago, it's a 20-sided die. And I always pick 19 on the 20-sided die. And it's never 19, but I always still pick it. And I'm going to pick 20 because, you know, why not? Because that's what you always pick on the tw- on the what? The, it, the what? How do you say that word again? <laughs> <laughs> Icosahedron. Icosahedron. Yeah. I like D20 better. It was... Shut the front door. It's a 19. Whoa. It's never, ever, ever 19. Well, I'm guessing it's a 19 one out of 20 times. Mm, No. (laughs) Statistically, no. (laughs) We roll these an awful lot, and this is the very first time it's ever rolled a 19. But statistically, yes, it would be one in 20 times if you rolled it a lot of times. (laughs) If I rolled it more than 20 times. Correct. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I have a 1 in 20 chance of getting it. Yes. But it's not, you know, 1 in 20 times you're going to come up with a 19. Correct. Yeah. Because I have a chance. That is correct. 1 in 20 chance. That is correct. Yes. So statistically, (laughs) I've now broken my brain. (laughs) Let's let's do what we used to call a sadistic lesson because we found statistics at the university level were pretty (laughs) tough. Statistics are sadistic. (laughs) They are sadistic. (laughs) And your prof is a masochistic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that was fun. So I guess we had a 12, a 12, a 5, and a 19. We're obviously not psychic. How about you guys listening out there? How did you guys do? And do you like using the proper math names for these beautiful shapes? Uh, it was great to remember that. So thank you, Nissa, for uh, giving me the poke to use some math terms in the dice game. 